Go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. It's going to sound old, but I don't care. It's freaking me out how big some of the children are. Three years for me, I just get a little fatter, maybe a little less hair. Three years for your kids, my goodness. you got like young ladies and adults, young adults out there that used to be little, little munchkins. Um, it, it's really good to be here. Uh, we got to spend some time yesterday uh, around visiting some of our old places. We ate one of our favorite hamburgers yesterday for lunch. We ate our favorite pizza the night before that. So, so far it's been a food holiday. Um, but I just can't express, at least without not getting tearful and blubbery right at the beginning, um, what a joy it is to see all of you. And the shepherds, they've grown quite a bit. They've got two Yankees preaching. I don't know, you know, good job. I mean, that's real character there. I appreciate that. We can grow. Not just Yankees, Indiana boys. I mean, Caleb lives in Brooklyn, but he's Indiana through and through. He, he knows what corn looks like and when it's ready to, to harvest. So, Our goal is exactly what Don spoke about. We hope to point you to Hebrews, and we hope that you will listen. In fact, you're going to see that throughout the letter, that call to listen is there time and time again. In fact, as we consider what it is that we're doing this whole weekend, Caleb and I, when we got together, and first of all, I should say a couple things about Caleb. I appreciate him so much. I appreciate his family, the work they're doing in New York. That is not necessarily the easiest place to do the Lord's work, but it needs to be done. And he's committed himself to that. And then just working on this lectureship with him was such a joy to work with him, to hear how he thinks, and to, to gain from his experience has been tremendous. But when we talked, when we got together, when we were thinking about what do we want to accomplish, Don and the shepherds had given us Hebrews, this is fixing your eyes on Jesus. And, and what we decided was if you go there to Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 12, probably a passage that many of us are familiar with, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Notice it says the word of God is active and sharper. It doesn't say Andy Harrison is active and sharp. It doesn't say Caleb Churchill is active and sharp. It says the word of God. Yes, God has blessed us with men and, and, and women who are capable of studying and understanding and being teachers. But ultimately, the power is found in the Word. So as we worked together, as we planned, we said Hebrews is one of those letters, and, and we were texting back and forth just the other day, Hebrews is one of those letters that as I draw back to my memory of going to church as a child, is you pretty much looked at chapters 1 through 4, you might pick a little thing out of 6 because they wanted you to pay attention, and then you jump to the end of the book. You'd hit chapter 10 because that's why you got to go to church. And then you get into the chapter 11, all those heroes of faith. And I'm not saying that's not useful and that's not beneficial. But we were talking about this letter and there's so much more. There's layer upon layer. There's connections upon connections. And one of our goals this weekend, if we do our job correctly, if we use the word correctly, is you will leave with a passion to understand more about this letter. You will be driven to read it and study it for yourself so that you can gain from that living and active Word of God. We're going to guide you, but that's not our, we're not the power. The power is in the message. And so what, the, what you're going to see is we're going to, we're going to take you through the entire letter to the Hebrews. And we're going to do our best to help you understand the structure, the content. We're going to try to get to the intention of the writer and then draw application for us. In light of that, Caleb reminded me of this passage or this instruction that Paul also gave to Timothy. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And so what, what we're going to do, if, if you're here all the way through Sunday morning, you will, we will read publicly from this pulpit every word in the letter of Hebrews. So at the beginning of each lesson, we will read what we will be covering. And that means it's going to be awkward because we're not used to doing that. That come Sunday morning, I timed mine Sunday morning, when I'm getting to the end, it's going to be 10 minutes of just me reading out of the Word. Oh, can we handle it? But the idea is we want to point you towards the message and then help us draw some conclusions from that message. So in light of that, what I want to do as we get started really quickly is I want to sort of set us up for the letter 
how we've sort of divided out the letter and how that relates to the lessons that we're going to hear this weekend. So if you consider chapters 1 through 2, so this lesson and and Caleb's lesson in just a little bit is going to be taken from chapters 1 through 2. And make sure that you consider who the audience is. It's interesting that as you read the letter to the Hebrews, it's very apparent that the writer expected his audience to understand the law and the Torah. If you don't know what the Torah is, and I'm not trying to be uh, crass or silly, then that means that you don't quite have what the writer expects yet. (laughs) That's not a problem. We're going to work through that. But the reality is, is the, the writer writes this letter with an expectation that you will know the law and the Torah. Which means as we go through, if there's things that are unfamiliar, if there's things that you don't understand, make a note, take a note, write it down. That's again, we're hoping to drive you to deeper study to get that power out of the Word. But in all of these, we're focusing on the fact that Jesus is superior. So in chapters 1 through 2, he talks about this idea of Jesus is superior to the angels in the Torah. And look there at chapter 2. At chapter 2, he says, for, in, for verse, chapter 2, verse 2, for if the words spoken through angels prove unalterable. Angels is the idea of the messengers, the ones delivering the word. So the idea is that Jesus is superior to the messengers and to the law itself, to the Torah. And that's going to co- coordinate with our first two lessons this morning. In chapters 3 through 4, he talks about how Jesus is superior to Moses and the promised land. Now you've got to consider your audience. What was Moses to the Jew. He was the lawgiver. It was the seed of Moses that the Pharisees sat in. He was everything. And remember, the law of Moses was not just what they did on Sundays. It was the structure for their society. It was their legal system. He says Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to the land. The land was everything. From the time they came out of Egypt, they were headed towards a land, a land of their own. The inheritance, and and there were laws in place to keep that land in the families, to keep that land in the tribe. Jesus is superior to the promised land. In chapters 5-7, through Jesus is superior to the priests in Melchizedek. You've got to consider what were the priests, and we're going to get to that later today, but what were the priests? When you think about the priesthood, think about the word access access, to be in the presence of God, to to feel God's forgiveness, to to feel the mercy and grace of God. There was so much that the priesthood had to do with that. Jesus is superior. Jesus is superior to the sacrifices of the covenant. Imagine being a Jew, how much the sacrifices were a part of your day-to-day life. How much your world, your relationship with God, involved the taking of blood. Those sacrifices. And he goes, and we're going to go through all of this text, and from chapters 1 through 10, he's taking all of these things that were so important to the audience, that were essential to their structure and their relationship with God. And he's saying Jesus is superior. In essence, he's saying Jesus is superior to everyone and everything. And if we do our job correctly this weekend, we will challenge you, I will challenge myself, when I look at my life, When I look at where I put priorities and the importance of things, am I truly keeping Jesus where He belongs? Is He elevated above everyone and everything? And then finally, as we close, Hebrews chapter 11 through 13, because Jesus is superior to everyone and everything, endure to the end. Remain faithful. Don't let go. Don't turn back. Don't let persecution and trials and hardship, don't let tradition, don't let those things rob you from what you're meant to be. Hold on. Hold fast. You're going to hear terms like draw near. You're going to hear about the promise over and over and over. You're going to get this idea of hold fast. There's this idea of endurance that you're going to see throughout the letter. But why are we enduring? Why are we holding on? Why why is it so important to focus on Jesus and on the promises? Because He's above. He's superior. He's elevated above everyone and everything. And then throughout the text, you have these warnings. And I ask you to pay, pay particular attention to these warnings because as we're going through, as we're elevating Jesus above everyone and everything, human nature, distractions, our own sinful pride, our own willfulness, 
distracts us from the promise, distracts us from the goal, distracts us from the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to look at some of these warnings as we go throughout the text. Our goal, our goal, in addition to driving you to Hebrews, to wanting to know, to wanting to dig deep, our goal is relatively simple. And it's simple. And, and honestly, you, you might choose your own words, but I think it's the goal of the Hebrew writer as well. Our goal is to elevate Jesus. That at the end of this weekend, you know exactly where he fits. Which is pretty simple. It's at the very top, isn't it? But, when, but, but it's this interesting dynamic, right? Because as we're elevating him, we're called to draw near. Elevating him above everyone and everything, yet we're drawing near to that elevated Jesus. And we're going to see what that means a little bit clearer later on. But drawing near and enduring to the, enduring to the end. That's our goal. I think that's the goal of the Hebrew writer. So go ahead and turn to chapter 1. Chapter 1 of, Hebrew is where, of Hebrews is where... Uh, there we go. Chapter 1 of Hebrews is where we're going to begin this morning. Um, I told you that every time we're going to read our text, mine is going to take about half a second. Because I'm going to focus on the first three verses of Hebrews. That's going to be our whole lesson this morning. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways... In these last days has spoken to us, in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become a much better, having become much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Don mentioned encouraging us to listen. And I said that this is a theme throughout the letter. I want us to look at that. Look how the book starts. He says, God spoke to our fathers long ago. And how did He do that? He did it through the prophets. And God's speaking to us now. And how is He doing it? He's doing it through His Son. Notice the idea of speaking is forefront of the letter. God is speaking to us. He did it long ago through the prophets to our fathers. He's doing it now to us through His Son. What's the big deal with speaking? We're going to see throughout this letter there is this concept of speaking, God speaking, and an urgency for us to listen. In fact, even in these first three verses, you have God speaking multiple times. You've got Him speaking to the fathers. You've got Him speaking to, through His Son. But notice verse 2 at the end of verse 2. Through whom He also made the world. I hope that as soon as you read that, that phrase, through whom He made the world, what do you think of? Go back to Genesis 1. And what does it say in Genesis 1? And God said, let there be light. I think it was a lectureship a number of years ago where somebody, it may have even been you, Caleb, I can't remember. Words have power because worlds were created with words. From the beginning, it was God speaking that created all things. So you've got it starting out saying He spoke to the fathers through the prophets long ago. He's speaking it to us now through His Son. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away from it. Pay attention to what you've heard. Listen. God speaking, you listen. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. Nope, that's wrong. I should probably actually read my notes. That might help. Oh, there we go. I'm on the wrong page. Uh, people who know me know that that's a common mistake, so forgive me. Look at chapter two, verse uh, chapter three, excuse me, verse fifteen. We'll start in verse fourteen. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. See, he, see that idea of holding fast. While it is said today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked Him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of the Egypt led by Moses. So you, you get this urgency, this plea to hear. Don't harden your hearts when you hear his voice. Drop down to chapter 4, verse 2. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not unified by faith in those who heard. And so it's not just enough to hear, to pay attention to who's speaking, but you've got to unite that hearing with faith. It's got to be combined with belief. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 11. Concerning Him, we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That's sluggish hearing. Lazy hearing. 
The letter starts out saying, God spoke long ago to our fathers through the prophets. He's speaking to us now through His Son. You need to listen. Pay attention. Don't drift away. When you listen, make sure that your heart's not hard. When you listen, make sure that it's combined with faith, with belief. And don't get lazy in your listening. Go ahead and keep your, your hand in Hebrews, but I, I just want us to look at uh, Matthew chapter 13 real quick. Matthew chapter 13. Because this kind of message, this urgency to listen, this, this concern about being dull of hearing, of having hard hearts, it's not new at all in the New Testament. In fact, it's something that Jesus battled with extensively. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to pick up right in the middle, but his disciples are asking him, why is it that you speak in parables? Why is it that you speak in parables? In fact, um, he's got this phrase, and this is going to be familiar to most of you, but look at uh, chapter 13, specifically uh, verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 43, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a phrase Jesus uses over and over and over. Is he talking, is he, is he, is he being sort of a, what, what discriminating? I don't want the deaf to hear this. If you're deaf, if you're disabled, if you're hearing impaired, this isn't for you. Is that, is that what he's talking about? He who has ears to hear? No, he's saying you need to listen. If you've got a heart to listen, in fact, look at chapter 13 again, when the disciples asked, beginning in around verse 10, they said, why is it that you preach in parables? And he says in verse 11, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. You notice what Jesus is doing? They say, why is it you're preaching parables? And, and I can remember growing up as a kid, and I probably even said this from the pulpit. Well, it's an analogy to help people understand. Not really. Yes, sort of. If you're willing to work, if you've got ears to hear, it's an analogy to help you understand. But Jesus says, I'm challenging them. They don't have hearts to understand. They, they hear it, but they're not hearing it. Their heart is hard. They're, they're not willing to forego what they already know, what they already believe in order to take in what I'm saying. And that's the same urgency that we have in the letter to the Hebrews. Is Suspend your traditional thinking. Suspend your hard heart. Get rid of this me-first attitude. Listen to who's speaking. Listen, it's interesting, and I, I, this is a tangent, but oh well. Look at the end, in this whole section in Matthew, where Jesus is going through this, why He speaks in parables, and He's giving these parables. I love what He says here at the end, uh, towards the end of chapter 13 in verse 52. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe, remember, a scribe would be someone familiar with the law, a student of the law, Someone who knew and understood the law. Most often in, in the Gospels you hear that phrase, scribes and Pharisees. Okay, it's, it's the religious experts. Everyone, for, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple, a follower, okay, you are the learned, you're the educated, you're the religious, and you have become a disciple of the kingdom. Look what has to happen. Is like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now, on the surface, that's a little... But that word brings is translated about 90% of the time, even in Matthew chapter 13, as cast out. Most of the time when Jesus cast out the demon, cast out the demon it's that exact same word. Read it that way. Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who casts out of his treasure things new and old. If you're a scribe, someone who, who has that religious background, that religious knowledge, you're an expert in the law, Let's say you've gone to church your whole life. You know stuff. And you become a disciple of Jesus. You need to be prepared to cast out treasures, stuff important to you, new stuff and old stuff. Cast it out 
so that you can hear. Our preconceived ideas, our preconceived notions about who Jesus is and what He expects from me can often prevent us from hearing. Are we able to listen? Go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Who is it that's speaking? You're going to see a lot of comparisons in the letter to the Hebrews. There's a lot of comparisons in the letter to the Hebrews. Who is it that's speaking? Notice in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in portions in many ways. So he's taking how God used to communicate, how God would reveal His mind, what He wanted, His desire, His will to the fathers was through the prophets. Prophets, that idea of a mouthpiece. It's a spokesperson, it's a mouthpiece. Sometimes we always think about telling the future, that sometimes is part of it, but that's not the essential definition. Moses was a prophet. He was a mouthpiece for God. God would speak to him. In fact, when, when, at the beginning when God was calling Moses and he's, oh, I, I can't speak too good and I, 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 I'm not the one and all these excuses, Aaron can speak. Aaron will be your mouthpiece. Aaron will be your prophet, Moses. So it says God used to speak through prophets. He would have mouthpieces. And that was long ago to our fathers. He says in those days, uh, and they spoke in many portions in many ways. The idea is, is they got pieces. Not one prophet had everything, did they? This prophet added this and this. And, and when you take the sum of what the prophets, many portions, and he would do it in many ways, dreams and visions and other ways we could look through Scripture, and then you would get the whole. So the writer is saying, our fathers, this is how they had it. And he's not criticizing it. That's how God chose to do it. He spoke long ago to our fathers through the prophets, through a mouthpiece, in many portions and in many ways. Look how he compares that. In his last days, has he spoken through prophets? He spoke it through His Son. Not a mouthpiece, His Son. Whom He appointed heir of all things. Not just His Son, but the firstborn. There's position in that statement. Heir of all things. Through whom He also made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. And when he had made purification of the sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the prophets are dead and gone. It was long ago. The prophets were a mouthpiece. The prophets got pieces and bits and pieces and it was revealed to them in different ways. Jesus is now here speaking. And who is Jesus? He's the heir of all things. He's the Son. He's the One whom through the world was made. The radiance of His glory, the exact representation of nature is nature, and He upholds all things by the word of His power. Do you see the contrast? As opposed to a mouthpiece, you have the Son who is the exact representation of the Father. The radiance of His glory. That word glory is this idea of the weightiness of something. The weightiness of something. Jesus radiates the weightiness of who God is. The idea of that exact representation, it's the idea of imprint. In fact, um, oftentimes if you, if you know what the wax seal is, you'd have that imprint ring. And what's the whole point of that? What's on here ends up right there. The exact imprint of it. See, as, as, a, as a contrast to this many portions in many ways, and he's speaking through a mouthpiece, we now have the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature. Him who brings forth or upholds all things by the word of His power. This is not bits and pieces. Do you remember what was said when Jesus would preach? Do you remember one of the audience's common reaction? Yeah, besides the Pharisees wanting to kill Him. One of the audience's common reaction is, this is different. I'm paraphrasing. This is different. He doesn't speak like the other scribes and Pharisees. Do you remember the word they'd often use? He speaks as one with authority. He speaks as one with authority. The idea is quite simple. He has authority because He's God in the flesh. He has authority because He is God in the flesh. Turn to John chapter 1. I love the way this is worded in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, as we're talking about this idea of who is speaking, the fact that God is speaking, that God has this expectation with us to listen with urgency, and as we're going to see through Hebrews, there are real and eternal consequences if we fail to listen. 
In John chapter 1, how is Jesus introduced? In John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things came, all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Drop down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after Me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before Me. For, for of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. So, so we, we take this idea of God in the flesh, the, the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature. That God became flesh. And He lived among us. He dwelt among us. And notice what it says in verse 18. Law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So you, going back to Hebrews 1, he says, you had the prophets. Your fathers had the prophets. Giving them what God wanted them to have. But it was in part. It wasn't complete. Now, we have His Son, the heir of all things, the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, who brings forth all things by His power. He's bringing completion everything. It's not many portions. It's not many ways. It's Jesus, the Son of God, in the flesh, giving us the mind of God. So where's the urgency? The urgency is listen. The urgency is listen. Before we go back to Hebrews, I want... This is, uh, again, another tangent. But notice there in John chapter 1, he says in John chapter 1, he says, He dwelt, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I want you to just turn quickly to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus has just told His disciples, I'm leaving. And where I'm going, you can't come. He's obviously talking about His, his impending crucifixion and death. And they're obviously upset about this. And in verse, chapter 14, verse 1, He says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, you may be also. Your translation might, this is one of those common passages where it has the word mansions, which I don't like to beat up translations, but that's bad. That's, that's not the word. That dwelling place is the idea of a room in the house. It's like saying, if I, if I invited you over, you've got a room. I've got a room just for you in my house. It's not this idea of this marital, marital, marital that's not even a word, materialistic, that's what I was searching for materialistic idea of, oh, we all get our mansions. How's that coincide with Scripture? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I want to get to heaven because I'm going to finally have that mansion I never got on earth. No, it's you get a room in God's house. You get a room in God's house. The idea is you're going home. But like a home that we've never known, even, even if you were raised in the most loving, kind, considerate, supportive environment, we're going home. But that's the same word that's used in John chapter 1, where what did Jesus do first? He came and dwelt. He left home and came and dwelt so that eventually He could go back and prepare a dwelling for us. The picture is absolutely beautiful. Jesus, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His nature, He whom through the world was made put on flesh so He could dwell among us so that one day we could dwell with Him in heaven. And going back to Hebrews, that's who is speaking to us now. That's who is speaking to us now. So you can understand in chapter 2, verse 2, when the writer says, 
If the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Were there consequences? Were there consequences when the Israelites failed to listen to the prophets? Just read the book of Lamentations. Read Isaiah. Read Ezekiel. Read Jeremiah. Specifically, read Jeremiah. Were there consequences for failing to listen to the prophets? There were horrifying consequences. To describe, what, especially the people who remained in Jerusalem and what they went through, what those Israelites went through when it was under siege. I mean, they literally got to the point where mothers were eating their children. And it can all be traced back to refusing to listen to the prophets. What does Hebrews 2, 2, and 3 say? If there were consequences for failing to listen to the prophets, that's the message spoken through angels. If there, angels, if there were consequences, dire, terrible consequences, who everybody in his audience would have ready recollection of what those were, how much severer if we neglect to listen to the Son of God? The radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature. How much severer? So there's two things happening in this letter to the Hebrews. There is this elevation of Jesus that should put us in awe, that should drop us to our knees, and we're just like, I can't fathom why He would care for me. And then there's this other consequence, this other re realization in the letter to the Hebrews, that if I take that Jesus that is elevated above, above everyone and everything, and I decide to do my own thing, I, I fail to listen, I, I cast him down, and say, I don't care what he has to say, there are severe consequences. And that's the choice that we all have every single day. Listen or not listen. Put Jesus in His proper place in our lives or, or elevate ourselves above Him. There are consequences. So as we close, and I've just got a couple more thoughts, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Go, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read something out of Hebrews 12. I want you to see, and obviously I've, I've probably said the word listen about a thousand times already. It's not just because I'm a dad and I have to say that to my kids constantly. In, in Hebrews 12, as, we're, as he's wrapping up the letter, as the writer's wrapping up the letter, he brings us back and he says, see to it, verse 12, uh, 25, Hebrews 12, 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned, whom he warned from earth, much less will we escape to turn away from him if we turn away from him who warns from heaven. See, the whole letter begins with he spoke long ago to our fathers through the prophets. Now he's speaking through his son, the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. That's who's talking now. It ends the letter with don't refuse him who speaks. Don't refuse. So the question I want us to consider as we wrap up, as you turn to Genesis, I told you to do that and I didn't do it. Genesis chapter 3. Who is it that we're listening to? That's the question regardless of your age, regardless of where you're at in life, whether you're, you're just going into middle school and junior high and in, into high school, or whether you're moving on to college, or whether you're in your first job, or whether you're three weeks married. We just did 24 a couple weeks ago, so... Sorry, that's my pep talk. Doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're retired, but where we have so much coming at us. There are so many sources of information telling you where you should focus, what's important, what's not important. We are bombarded with what to listen to. And oftentimes, if we're not intentional with what we're listening to, it'll just get subconsciously fed into our mind. 
And we could go, we could go around the room. I got a little bit of time. I'm ahead of schedule, right? So we could go around the room and what is it that you feel pressure to listen to? And what is it you feel pressure to? And what is it? And everybody would have some nuance or some difference. Because now and then, and I know I sound old, but when I was your age, this middle part here, not you in the back, Bohannon's, you're old too, like me. When I was your age, I didn't have all of the technology that would feed me stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I didn't have it. I actually had to like get newspapers and stuff. But we are bombarded now, and that's not just a young people thing. I mean, I got my phone here. I got, oh, that's not my phone. This is my phone. See how old I am? I don't even know what a phone is. I got my iPad, I got this, I got that. At any moment, in fact, I'm, I'm digressing, I, I got too many tangents. But in fact, one of our big challenges of this is Stephen, my, my 11-year-old, his bag didn't make it on the plane. Now, it showed up at the airport at 6 p.m. on Thursday night, but we didn't get it until 8 p.m. last night, even though it was at the Houston airport. I mean, I was, and I had to call, and I was on hold for 45 minutes. I mean, in this day and age, where's my app that tells me exactly where my bag? I mean, I'm just, you can ask my family, I'm losing my mind. Like, what is going on? But the reality is, is there's, with technology, with all the stuff that's coming out, you got this opinion and that opinion, this is important, that's not important. You're dumb if you believe that, and you're dumb if you believe that. And you should wear a mask, you shouldn't wear a mask. COVID's going to kill you, it's no big deal, it's just a cold. I mean, all this information, and they disagree with each other, and they conflict, and trying to get you riled up, and some of it... Oh, man, what are we listening to? Genesis chapter 3, and we could go through, and everybody would have a slightly different answer to what is pressuring them. But it goes back to the same thing. No matter what the source, no matter what the message, it all gets back to the root. In Genesis chapter 3, when Satan is talking to Eve, listen to what he says. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Simple question. And she, re, re, she, she obviously knows what God's command was. She knows what His instruction was. Listen to what the devil says, the serpent says. Verse 4, you surely will not die. For God knows in the day when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the women, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. You surely won't die. That was partially true. Did they drop dead immediately? It was partially true. There's half truths. You ever folk? Uh, you ever have to face half truths? He says, "For God knows." Did you catch that? God knows. Just the way that's worded. He's he's saying God can't really be trusted. God's got an ulterior motive. God's holding out on you because He knows that when you eat of it, you'll be like God. There's something you're missing. You're not getting everything. You, you could be more. We can put this, these same phrases, half-truths, God's holding out on you, He can't be trusted. You could be more. There's something you're missing out on. We could put that into just about any situation. Because at the end of the day, what the world is trying to do, what Satan is trying to do, is he's trying to, for us, trying to get us to elevate ourselves to God in our minds. He's trying to get us to take God off of His throne, to take Jesus off His throne, and to put me up there. And you hear it in all sorts of phrases. You know, like, whatever makes you happy. Just, you know what? Just do whatever makes you happy. I have heard men say, I'm leaving my wife because this woman over here who's not my wife makes me happy. And they were Christian men who thought that God wanted them to be happy. Just do whatever makes you happy. That elevation of ourselves, taking Christ off the throne, putting ours, it comes in the idea of, you know what? Just follow your dreams. Follow your desires. To each his own. This idea of, you know what, well, that's your truth. I'm fine, you know, that's your truth. You can have your truth, I'll have my truth. It's okay, we'll go on our peaceful ways because, you know, truth is all relative. It comes to this, this whole idea. I mean, what you're doing here, you young people, this is so old-fashioned. I mean, really? You're, I mean, do you know how old this book is? This is older than Constitution. We're trying to throw that thing out. Why are you listening to this? What are you, nuts? 
This is a religion that's outdated. It's superstitious. It's holding you back. I mean, I am literally standing up here telling you not to do stuff that would be really fun. That's so old-fashioned. It's elevating ourselves to a God. It's narcissism. Man, medicine, and science knows best. Anytime science comes out with some new fact, especially one that proves the exist, that God doesn't exist, just remember it was those same forefathers of those scientists that said the earth was flat. We were really, really smart right up until we're not. But the reality is, is there are all these voices telling you all these things and the message is the same. You're the most important thing in the universe. Don't you forget it and do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever drives you, your pleasures, your, your focus. All, man is it. And not to pick on the world, the same thing can happen in the church. We can be driven by tradition. We can be driven by how we've always done it. Church can become nothing more than an academic pursuit where it never really grabs our heart. We can fight and devour each other over what the color of the carpet is. The reality is, is any time we're not listening to the sun, it's idolatry. We're taking Jesus off of His throne and we're replacing it. Is Jesus above everyone and everything in your life? Is Jesus above everyone and everything in my life? Who are you listening to? Who am I listening to? The heir of all things through whom the world was made, the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, God in the flesh who dwelt among us, who sits on the throne. We have His mind. We have His instruction. He is speaking. Listen to Him. Thank you. I praise you with all of-